You're about to join Niels Kostrup Larsen on a raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Mark Resimsinski and I, Niels Castro Larsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global market through the lens of a rules-based investor. For those of you who are regular listeners, this podcast series is all about voicing our differences on the one topic that brings us together, namely systematic investing, using the often overlooked but very robust strategy of trend following we hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity to learn more by diving into the back catalog and listen to all of the past episodes that you may have missed. Like last week's episode with Rich, where we took a deep dive into the new narrative about what trend following is and how to explain it, as well as the origin story of outliers. And we followed this up by publishing a summary of the episode on the toptradersunplug.com website in the blog post section. So if you missed that one, I invite you to go back and listen to the episode and read the blog post. Mark, great to be back with you this week at the end of an eventful week, actually, and an eventful month, I think it's fair to say. How are you doing? How are things where you are? Very good. I'm just coming out of a, a blizzard uh, out here in Boston. So so we had a really bad snowstorm. I, I had 18 inches of snow uh, I think Boston itself had over two feet, so uh, we'll be digging out. But it's supposed to be sunny and cold today. So, but I'm so I'm I, I'm ready to do a podcast as opposed to shoveling snow. Absolutely, we'll definitely make sure to keep you warm as we go through some really great topics and questions that have come in. Before, of course, let me just uh, acknowledge those of you who gave a. Uh, uh, a left a rating and review uh, this week. We so appreciate this, and if I could come up with a little ask, perhaps, of all of you, uh, is to share these uh, episodes, uh, maybe with three like-minded friends. And to make it easy for you, I created a link called toptradersunplug.com forward slash share. So if you would send that to uh, your friends uh, or colleagues, then it's super easy for them to choose exactly which podcast platform they want to listen to. Now, with all that said, uh, let's look at what went down this week. As economists debate, the message Chairman Powell, Powell delivered to investors on Wednesday, the fact remains that the Fed continues to pursue emergency monetary policy. For evidence, one need only to look at the bi-weekly system open market account holdings report that was released this past Wednesday. The report, which essentially is the Fed's balance sheet, has swelled now to $8.3 trillion, up from $7.74 trillion in September more than half a billion dollars injected in the economy in the last four months. Much was made about the Fed beginning balance sheet runoff before the tightening cycle begin, but perhaps we should be more concerned that the Fed will continue to manipulate the yield curve lower at a time when they should be allowing market forces to do some of the work for them and push rates higher. Now, that's not to say that market forces aren't having any impact, the two-year note looks to close this week at 1.17%. That's 17 basis points higher than last week's uh, close. However, if you look at sellers of the 30-year notes, uh, were you know they were pretty much absent this week, uh, and the long bond closed the week out pretty much unchanged. To put this into perspective, with consumer expecting 4.9% inflation over the coming 12 months, a measure by the University of Michigan survey, investors are willing to lock up 30-year investments at 2.09%. Now, historically, investors have demanded a yield to maturity of at least 100 basis points over the rate of inflation. Using that rule of thumb, the 30-year bond is 51 points. Yeah, I'll just repeat that, 51 points overvalued. Now, to be clear, if the yield to maturity of a 30-year bond was yielding 5.9%, the price would be 44 per bond, not the current price of 95, which is where it's trading. Even if one believed that the Fed would be successful in reducing long-term inflation back to 2.5%, the long bond is still overvalued by about 25 points. Now, bond math doesn't lie. 
Attention next week will turn to the January employment report that comes out on Friday. Consensus is for a more trend-like gain of 172,000, and that's a little bit lower than the 199,000 of new jobs registered in December. Given now the ongoing demand for labor, I guess we couldn't be too surprised if the actual number comes in around 200,000. Now, elsewhere in equity land on Thursday, a gauge of unprofitable technology stocks compiled by Morgan Stanley fully erased its COVID-era gains, sinking some 66% below its early 2021 high watermark. Trouble was also fined in the world's second largest economy as Chinese asset prices have joined the Western cousins in full retreat, with China set to largely shut down for next week's Lunar New Year. The benchmark CSI 3000 index has slipped into bear market territory with its lowest close since September 2020, while an index of offshore high-yield bonds compiled by Bloomberg is trading at firmly distressed levels with a yield to worst of near 19%. In addition to all the Fed statements this week, I did come across a Bloomberg interview with GMO's Jeremy Grantham, who discussed the outlook of what he thinks is a super bubble, not just a bubble, and it's about to burst. I want to bring you in, Mark, after this long introduction, just to touch on some of the things that have caught your attention from either a market perspective or some of the other stuff that you follow. Um, what's catching your eyes at the moment? Well, I think the overall theme of the first uh, few weeks of the year is that we're not in a crisis. This is a correction in the market. And what I would sort of say, it's almost a return to normalcy. And when you think about the difference between a crisis and normalcy, a crisis would sort of say there's overreaction. There doesn't seem to be rationality in the behavior of prices. The correction that we're seeing now uh, in the equity markets seems to be more of a return to normalcy because the uh, what uh, the re- drivers that are causing prices to fall make perfect sense. We're having slower growth. You know, we had let's say five uh, global growth was about five point nine percent last year. The IMF reported at first that they expected that twenty twenty two is going to be four point nine. Now it's four point four. Uh, so if you have lower growth, you're going to have lower cash flows that are generated for companies, and so valuation will be lower. So you're expecting four Fed hikes, okay? That means that the discount rate is going to go higher. So if you discount uh, forward cash flows, those should be lower. Equities should go down. And uh, there's an interesting thinking about equities where they say that there's actually a duration for equities. The duration is when the cash flows come for companies. Some companies have more of their cash flow sooner. Others let's say a high growth company is expected to have the cash flow further out in the future. If you have cash flows expected further out into the future, if there's an increase in the discount rate, it's going to have a greater impact on prices. So we'll sort of say the long duration equity, uh, equity, uh, equities, such as uh, we'll call most of the tech high flyers, are actually have been hurt more than they will call it the low duration stocks. So everything that we're seeing so far this year makes perfect sense, not extrapolating your own forecast, but just from what we're seeing in the actual data right now. I couldn't agree more. And actually another thing that I think people need to pay attention to that is also a return to normalcy, and that is we suddenly have yet again positive correlation between stocks and bonds, which we haven't seen consistently for quite a while, but that is the norm. But I think people have kind of forgotten that when equities fall, bonds don't have to go up in price. So um, if that's what we're we're going to to see going forward, more of that normalcy, then I think that a lot of portfolios around the world may not be positioned perfectly at this very moment. But time will tell. Let's review what's happening in our trend land, and then we're going to go back to, I'm sure, a lot of these topics as we get into our discussion. So on our side, in terms of uh, trend following, we had a a pretty strong week um, and actually um, a month and also a week, actually, that showed some strong anti-correlation to equities so far this year. And this goes to show that despite, for example, trend followers like us, and I'm sure most of our peers, 
being long equities at the moment, and of course we're suffering some losses in that sector in January, the wide diversification that we have in the portfolio has enabled us to produce overall pretty strong returns so far this year because of other things in the portfolio. And this is what it means to be an uncorrelated investment where even if you kind of know what the equity markets are doing, you can't really tell for sure what a fully diversified trend following strategy will do in response. And this is actually a very valuable attribute to have um, when you uh, look at your overall portfolio and of course why we argue in the um, nicest possible way. I hope um, that people should include that in their portfolio. Now, specifically for us, the performance drivers this week, uh, they were pretty widespread across the portfolio with only the equity sector uh, contributing with a net loss. Uh, but we did see gains in currencies, fixed income, energies. They were the main gainers, but also grain, soft and metals had a profitable week. Uh, my trend barometer actually, after having been uh, a little bit um, kind of weak for three months or so in Q4, has certain, suddenly woken up and uh, it closed Friday at a pretty strong level of 66, which I haven't seen since September of last year. So that's a nice number um, and actually confirms what I'm picking up from uh, the very early data. We're obviously not quite at month end, but the early data for the industry for January looks pretty robust. In terms of volatility, the week turned out to be another kind of wild ride for the markets with the S&P finally putting in an end, at least for now, to its losing streak. Yet it was on course for the worst month since March 2020, uh, as it closed the week at 44.32, which actually was up 0.7%, but still down around 7.5% uh, from its record high in January 3rd. And uh, I think I'd mentioned the lack of panic uh, in last week's market wrap, as demand for puts was pretty muted, but it didn't take long for an abrupt change in sentiment this week. Monday morning saw a deep plunge in the S&P 500, about 4% from Friday's close, alongside frantic put buying, and the index was approaching correction territory. However, the pendulum swung back really quickly as U.S. large caps had its biggest comeback rally since 2008, with the S&P 500 closing the day in the green. Now, the remainder of the week saw the S&P 500 calming down as market participants mulled over better than expected GDP numbers on Thursday. And interestingly, on a close-to-close -close basis, the S&P 500 had an extremely low realized volatility, about 15% annualized, which is only slightly above last year's average of approximately 13%. Um, yet the intraday ranges this week paint an entirely different picture. On our side, we had to uh, record a small loss for the week, about 60 basis points in our volatility strategy. Now, for my trend-following model uh, performance, um, which, by the way, you can see in the monthly report that we now put up, uh, you can see the long-term track record and all of that good stuff. Um, and we're not quite at month end. We still have one trading day left. But anyways, it's maybe not going to change much. But it was a slight positive week, even though the month looks like it's going to end down about one and a quarter percent. Um, and I attribute that probably to its short term nature or, or medium term nature, where it's been caught a little bit in some of these um, counter trend moves that we've seen both in energies um, and in equities and in fixed income. The performance... So far, um, group one down 1%, group two up quarter percent, and group three, uh, the fast reacting down 70 basis points. Um, the best sectors uh, are going to be, so far, energies, grains, and short-term interest rates. Not surprising, I guess. And the worst ones are equities, base metals, and precious metals. Single markets, are the best drivers so far this month is, uh, and therefore this year, U.S. 10-year notes, the euro and gas oil, and the worst markets uh, so far, it's all equities. It's the Swiss market index, it's the Australian spy, and it's the German DAX. In terms of riskiness, uh, it's gone up a little bit, the risk to stop, uh, meaning if all positions get stopped out on Monday, the uh, strategy would lose around 10.22%, and that's up from 8.69% a week ago. 
Now, before we dive into today's question, let me just acknowledge the other questions that came in uh, also this week from Carl Akul and and actually from you, Zach, who's, who's, has, who's got a question in this week. But you have another question and they're all addressed to other other people, uh, other the other co-hosts. So we appreciate all that and we'll bring them up as the uh, relevant co-host joins me in the coming weeks. But there was one specifically for Mark uh, from you, Zach. So... Let me read that out loud. Um, Zach writes, I did read Howard Mark's latest memo selling out and his comment about retail investors tend to be trend followers got me thinking about how one decides when to sell and my experiences as a retail investor, which I'm currently. Before my adaptation of trend following principles to my investment decision making process, I found that deciding when to sell an investment was a tougher decision than making the purchase decision. Personally, I feel that applying a systematic trading system, one entry, one stop, one uh, and uh, one uh, and one trailing stop, has improved my investing performance because it has clarified and simplified the selling decision making process. So my question is this, and I believe this would be a good one for Mark: Has there been any research into how systematic trading rules? improve someone's selling decision and how that affects performance over a discretionary process? If so, where can we find the research papers? Because I would be interested in reading them and comparing them to Howard Mark's arguments in his latest selling out memo. So thanks for that, Zach. Um, And Mark, what are your thoughts? Well, I think this is a very good question because I think that many people view that Entry is such as the real problem with any kind of model. When do I buy? And I've usually found that the, the, the real problem is not when you buy, it's when you get out. It's the, it's the more difficult issue. And the reason why is, is that there is, there's two ways that you could get out. One would be is, is that your model tells you that there's been a reversal in trend. So you move from a buy to a sell signal. So, and if you have a model that's uh, that's we'll call it a two phase model that means you're either going to be long or short then you don't really need stops what you do is you just sort of say that well I'm either going to sort of say that I have a long trend and if there's not a long trend there's a short trend the alternative uh for some models is what I call uh usually a breakout system a breakout system might be a three phase model so it could be long short or neutral and that be if there if the market is in a range bound, then you don't take any position. A little bit harder to model, but you know again is is, is that uh, it's easy to figure out what the entry points. The tough part uh, with trend following in general is the use of stops, and the use of stops uh, tells you, okay, if it goes below a certain level of price, I will exit my position. Uh, and I always view that a stop is telling you your model is wrong, so therefore it's time to reassess. And so reassessing is is that you take yourself out of the market and you limit your losses. The tough part about setting up with stops is that you have to figure out when to get back in again. So once you're out, you're out. Uh, and now you have to sort of say, to if you hit a stop, but your trend is still telling you to be long, you get back in at a certain time. There has been some highly mathematical work on stop losses that suggests that uh, uh, stop losses do not help, that they actually sort of hinder you, that it's better to just determine whether to be long or short or to use your model to determine entry and exit. Uh, I have looked at a lot of different models. Everyone believes that, oh, if I put stop losses in, automatically, by definition, I will get better results for any model I have. And that's not really true. You can have a situation that when you add in stops, because it takes you out of a lot of trades that could turn out to be very positive, you actually will get worse risk-adjusted performance with stops than without. So we'll sort of say that the exit issue is a very difficult, uh, difficult decision. But it still gets back to the whole issue is that you have to have discipline. Now, I read over Howard Marks's argument, and one is is that he uh, 
always sort of argues, and this is a trope that many people use, that, well, retail investors are trend followers. Uh, and that's sort of the silly, uh, not smart money. And you don't want to be that. When I always say that there's a difference between retail investors that are trend chasers than uh, someone who's a systematic model builder who could be using prices to follow trends. A trend chaser who could be chasing themes, they could be chasing prices without a system or disciplined approach uh, will be a loser in the market. A trend follower who has a disciplined, systematic approach to when they would enter and exit markets is a long-term winner. That being said, is this is that you have to realize this is that when you look even at trend followers and other strategies, a lot of the sharp ratios that you will see over the long run are probably lower than what most people think. So uh, if you look at uh, sharp ratios for trend followers, they're going to be usually below one in the long term. But the same applies to a lot of other strategies. So, uh, and that is disconcerting for a lot of investors when they say that my return to risk is going to be uh, below one, which means is that my returns per unit of risk is not going to be one for one at minimum. Uh, but in the long run, that could still be a winning strategy for wealth accumulation. Now, I think the important part, and, and you said, well, what is the literature? Is that we have to go back to some fundament, uh, fundamentals of, of finance that we found. First is this is that uh, you look at the active investing literature. Most of it is non-systematic, but you find that most active managers underperform benchmarks. And a benchmark, especially the S&P, which is cap-weighted, is implicitly a trend-based system because it actually increases your exposure in stocks that increase their market capitalization and they increase the market capitalization because prices go up. So in some sense is that an active manager versus a benchmark is active trading versus a trend type model. Okay. It's very disciplined, it's very structured, but it's still trend-based. So uh, all this tech stocks that have all gone up and become a bigger portion of the S&P 500, it's because of that, it's because their prices have gone up. Now you buy more and more into it at, at higher highs. So, uh, so we find that most active managers underperform. Okay. That doesn't tell you about systematic, but it just tells you discretion. The other thing we find, and this is a, going to Daniel Kahneman, is, is that uh, he wrote his last book, which he wrote with, uh, was on noise. Mm -hmm. And the key that, that they find with the noise trading is, 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 is that what you reduce noise by being systematic in your approach so that if you are viewed, if you see the same situation a year from now that you saw today, you will take the same action. If you didn't take the same action, then that, that's what actually creates noise. And so if you want to be a better, quote unquote, forecaster, if you want to be a better manager, you want to reduce bias and you want to reduce noise. Bias is if you're trying to hit a target, how close are you getting to, or is there a systematic difference of where your average is relative to the center of the target? And noise would be the spread around the target. So, so you say like, well, you want to be able to reduce bias, okay? So, so you got to get your forecast as close to the actual target as possible. But just as important is that we want to reduce the dispersion and the spread. And you could do that by being systematic. So, uh, and and I think the important part is, is I was reading some piece on on machine learning, and this person from uh, called. Uh, Cesar Hildago had an interesting comment in that people judge humans by their intentions, but they judge machines by their outcomes. And I think that's really important when you think about trading and your investment performance. You're not being judged by your intention. My intention was to make money. My intention was to, was to get good uh, uh, risk-adjusted returns. We'll sort of say if it was a person doing that, and they said, "Well, I didn't, I wasn't successful." 
but I really had good intentions. You'll say, well, we'll maybe give him the benefit of the doubt. Machine, we don't sort of say, well, he was intending to do well. You just sort of said, did it perform or did it not perform? My, my machine is my auto. It doesn't have the intention that it was supposed to start in the morning on a cold morning. It says, did it start or did it start? And when you think about your investing, should be that type of, it should be machine-like in the sense it's repeatable. So we reduce noise and it's, uh, and we judge it by its outcomes and not by the intentions of the models that we have. So now that being said, is this is when you talk about, well, what is the uh, risk that we face, uh, you know, when, uh, when doing models, this is that uh, I also came across, I wrote about this, you know, uh, late last year as a, there's a great quote by Cornelius Vanderbilt, you know, sort of the, the, the Commodore. He said, any fool can make a fortune. It takes a man of brains to hold on to it after it is made. And that applies to, to sort of trend following and building models and, and exit, which is ultimately the question you ask. Is, is, is that, this is that yeah, you could figure out a lot of ways in which to get in money and, and make a little money. Is, this is it, but it takes a lot of brains to figure out how to make sure that once you have it, you keep it. So, so, so I think that exits are, are critical. Being systematic is critical. Uh, you can sort of see a lot of the literature about uh, behavioral finance that suggests that we should be able to sort of hang on to our winners and sell our losers, which is the opposite of most behavior, which is to hang on to our losers and sell our winners. And I think ultimately, as this is that uh, Howard Marks in his comments, he was very interesting uh, on how he approached this. He said that, well, most people, what they do is they make selling decisions, and and they are, it's always based on on price. This is that prices go up, therefore I should sell because I should take some of my gains. Prices go down, I should sell because you know I uh, want to cut my losses. This is it, and he always sort of said that your decision to sell should be based on a change in valuation. Now, a trend follower is not a value trader, but a trend follower does have a model. So it's not as though that prices just go up and therefore I should uh, sell or prices go down, therefore I should sell. They go up and if they go up greater than a trend, then I I buy and I will not get out no matter what happens until that price goes below my trend. That's a very systematic approach to investing. You're acting like a machine. You're taking some of the emotions out of it. And that's where you're going to get your added value. Yeah, I mean, a lot to unpack in that comment. And I um, I don't want to get into uh, too many of the points because we have other topics to, uh, to uh, cover. I, I will just throw in something for you to ponder in your, in your since you're snowed, snowed under, so to speak, uh, literally uh, with the snowstorm you mentioned. <laughs> Um, but I thought it was very interesting when you talked about that machines, we kind of just judge them on what the out, output is and we don't think about their intention. And I couldn't help thinking about a recent podcast I listened to on, on uh, and I hope people won't judge me too much, but I mean, I have to, I will say, because it's, very, it's becoming very controversial, this topic, in terms of some of the guests that Joe Rogan is getting on his podcast. I've seen the uh, comments now. It's just incredible. Um, but one of them, very recent episode, it was all about Google and search engines. And I was kind of thinking, maybe we need to judge the intention of what they show us and not just what they show us, right? The output. So I'll leave it there, Mark. It's up, for, to, up to you and who else wants to look into this. Um, but I just think it's kind of an interesting um, uh, link there, but I do want to comment just briefly to uh, to 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 the topic or question from Zach, and 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 that is Mark is absolutely right that stops can be um, tricky, especially if you only have one because you're kind of either you're in the trade or you're out. So this is why we as trend followers, and I know it takes a certain amount of capital to do so, but this is why we use multiple entries and multiple exits. So what we're trying to do is not to be very precise about 
how the trend is going to develop and, and how it's going to reverse and when it's going to reverse. But we actually just want to do the best we can in an uncertain world um, by scaling in and scaling out uh, of these longer term trends. Um, because otherwise it is, uh, there's maybe a little bit too much lock or unlock involved if you just use one time frame and you're either in or you're out. Um, but you know, that you have to start somewhere and, and, and it's probably better to start there than, than not to have a stop, I would argue. But I do agree with you. And I've said this, uh, on the podcast over the years, um, that I, to some extent, believe that the exits uh, are more important. Of course, Jerry would say he's going to be on next week, so he can uh, always comment on this, of course. Um, he would say, yeah, but the entry is most important because you have to get into the trades. Obviously, I'm not arguing with that. That's clear. But to me, it's always been, you know, from the point of view to say, if you look at a chart, it's pretty easy to see where the trend began, that initial breakout. So, coming up with rules as to how you want to capture that entry, I think is easier than to figure out a, a good rule for how do you know if that trend has turned or if it's no longer valid. I, I just think it's it's harder. Um, let's put it at that. But they're equally important, of course. So I, I kind of agree with what you said. Right. I, I think the big the point that you made that's very important to, when you use different... Uh, Lengths to for entry. Trend following is is ultimately all about smoothing. What you're taking is data that's very rough, and a rough data is your raw data, and this is going up and down, up and down, and up up and down. And so the whole objective of trend followers say, how do I find a signal in this noisy data, this this rough data? And one way in which you could be able to help yourself out is to is to use different periods of smoothing. So uh, if you, let's say, have a stop loss that's just using on the rough data, is it that if there's a big intraday move, you could get knocked out of a position that maybe you should, you should keep. So sometimes that you'll use, uh, people use a trend following model without a stop, but they'll have, uh, they'll, they'll use, let's say, 40 days uh, for one uh, moving average and five days for another Five days is smoothing out some of the uh, the roughness in data, so so there's ways in which you could be able to get around the issue of you know large intraday moves that could knock you out of positions with stops, and that's by using different smoothing constants. So now when we're talking about the intentions versus uh, uh, outcomes, I always think of the comment that I once heard is that facts don't have feelings <laughs> and. Uh, and, sure. and this is uh, ultimately is you sort of say that the idea that facts don't have feelings is fundamental to trend following because you're just looking at the prices and you're sort of saying, I'm not sort of saying what it uh, feels like it should, the market should be doing, but you're saying that the, uh, it just is, is that this is the fact. The price says X on the close. This is what the open is. This is what the range is. I'm not going to judge that other than it is what it is. I'm not saying it has feelings. I'm not going to put judgment in it other than this is what the market is telling me. And it's one of the topic areas that we were going to talk about because I was having this discussion. I said, there's a difference between what markets should do versus what a market is doing. Yes, I'm going to stop you right there because I know we're going to come to it in, in 10 seconds or, or maybe a little bit longer. But I just want to intersect one thing because I, I think you bring up a really good point and that is, in a sense, trend following, it's really factual, right? It's evidence-based. The price is the price and that we that's what we use. We can't argue with that. So in all of that, you could say, yeah, there's no emotion in trend following. But all I can say is... <laughs> When you implement trend following, it brings out all the emotions uh, that you have because it's going to be joyous sometimes and it's going to be uh, painful another time. So, so that's the fun part where the emotions do come in. Right. And, and part of the idea is to, is to take all of that emotion out of it. This is that if you're being emotional and you're a trend follower, you have a problem here. <laughs> sure. Sure. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that you can't be frustrated, but the, the idea is that, like, I could be emotional, but I still will sort of say that the model is telling me what to do. So, yeah. Uh, and if you want to continue with that topic, let's just 
dive into it. Yeah. It doesn't matter. So, so you, you're right. I mean, the difference between should and is in investing. I mean, what what are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, on that? and I want to get back to just to, to close out okay. on the one thing about the Howard Marks uh, comment. Oh yeah, because, true. Because Ho- Howard's uh, Marks was arguing that uh, that you shouldn't use price as an indicator for when you should sell. So mm-hmm. that uh, that using uh, that it's a loser's game to follow price to making selling decisions because you will uh, there's rationalizations for why you should sell if the price is going higher and there's rationalizations for selling if the price is go uh, lower. His fundamental view is this is that the only thing you should use to determine exit and sale uh, of a position is value. That value is fundamental, and value is not equal to price. Okay. A trend follower would sort of say uh, that may be true, but I don't know what value is. So therefore, I'm going to sort of just focus in on price. And so he says, and this is the way both Howard Marks and trend followers could exist, because Howard is saying is that I don't care about price. That's just telling me what the opinion is of others. All I care about is the value of the company and what's the end of it. And as trend followers say, I don't care what value is because I don't know what I can, I don't know how to define that and I can't figure it out for sure. All I care about is what is the opinions of are placed in the marketplace. And also I would argue that I think it's hard to say, um, and I have a tremendous respect for hard marks, by the way, let me start by saying that, that value has nothing to do with price. I mean, it has everything to do with price, in my opinion, right? I mean, oh, it could absolutely. be overvalued, it could be undervalued. It all comes from where the price is. So I think it's, um, I, you know, I usually, uh, I, by the way, I mean, I would say also, I think that Howard Marks is good as, at, at really writing his stuff without being too um, black and white about these things. He, there's always a sort of a caveat somewhere in, in what he writes. So it's hard to see, but w- whether he's in one clear direction or another in terms of his arguments. But I will say with this particular memo, I was certainly less in, in agreement with some of the thoughts that he put forward, but that's just my take on it. People have to put their own spin on it. Well, it's always very thoughtful, and and I think that I've yeah. laid out the two extremes. And what we'll find out is, is, is that the two extremes could both coexist, okay, and they could both ex- uh, and they could both be able to make money. Um, and they may not actually agree in how is a market price determined. It's going to be actually tied ultimately to value and then the weighted opinion of of all of the people out there who trade who make up that price. So it's the weighted opinion of all of the value statements that p- people put together in price. But talking about this should versus is. Sure, let's do that. I think it's... Uh, and, and and only because we're in a podcast and you want to sort of keep things short, we sort of say we want to sort of cut it to sort of extreme uh, extreme views. Is it that the the value person or the person who's looking at fundamentals always say this is what markets should do, and because it's a should statement, we'll say that there's a difference between where the price is and where it should be, and the should trader will sort of say, I'm going to trade based on the difference between the two. So uh, the price of some tech stocks should be lower. So therefore, I'm going to sell. The price of tech stocks should be higher because they're going to control the world because they're going to generate so much cash flow in the future. So therefore, they should go higher. The trend follower is taking a a different view. Is say, uh, the market is doing this is telling me this that's all so therefore it's because it the market is therefore i'll just sort of react to what the prices i see in the marketplace if price uh if uh markets are moving higher well then i will just follow that particular price because i have it says that if it's above a certain moving average or or it's there's trending in, in the market then that will tell me what my action would be i don't I don't impose an ought to do or should do. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, that there isn't the use for information in, a, in an is world. You could say markets have been doing this 
uh, or have a certain probability of doing this. And so I can re- be able to sort of say, given this probability, uh, this is what will happen uh, or likely to happen. But I think there is a difference between a should and is trader. Yeah, but it's funny enough, funnily enough, you can actually combine them in the trend fund world because you could say, well, the market is moving up and therefore I should be long. Right. Well, there uh, uh, <laughs> we're, we're sort of talking about the valuation, but ultimately no, no, I know. this is that no. this gets down to one of the fundamental issues of trend following is that there are a lot of people will sometimes say that, well, I don't make a forecast because I'm a trend follower. I'm just following the prices. But you are making a forecast. This is that everybody makes a forecast. If you're sort of, if you're a trend follower, your forecast is, is that if the price is going up, it will continue to go up. That is a forecast. You are making a prediction. So uh, you're saying this is that I don't, uh, I have more uh, sort of belief or I feel that there's a higher likelihood that prices will go up because they have gone up in the past is more likely than prices will go up because I know some fundamental information or I know the linkage between what the Fed chairman might do or what future cash flows might look like. And that is my determination of why the price will go up. So so both are predictions. It's just where are you going to put say that there's a greater likelihood for one to be successful? Staying on the topic of predictions, and I don't know if this is even relevant for the next uh, topic you brought along, but uh, what you told me is that we're going to talk a little bit about commodities and inflation. So uh, is there a prediction in that topic today? Well, you know, the one thing that we sort of see is, is, is that, that uh, uh, this gets into the heart of, uh, of sort of, you know, generalizations that often can be wrong. So I think that the view has been, well, commodity markets you should invest in because we're going to get higher inflation. Inf- inflation uh, or commodities are a great hedge for inflation. This is that yeah, it's not exactly true. Now we'll sort of say it could be a better hedge versus fixed income or some other asset classes. But if you look back over the last years, this is is that. Uh, if we'll sort of say that inflation is the general increase in price levels that may be associated with, uh, you know, excess money or excess demand, uh, what we find out is, is is that if you look commodity by commodity, this is that there, there are uh, supply or specific uh, supply or demand issues for why some of the key markets and commodities have gone higher. And what you could easily sort of see, for example, is, is that we've had a huge increase in coffee prices. A lot of that is all weather-related. We had uh, wheat and corn increases, also weather-related. Um, recent issues of uh, natural gas. We see the most recent, this in January, is weather-related, which is also very seasonal. But at the same time, there's also been an increase in demand because of uh, shifting behavior in Europe and such. So commodities markets are an aggregation of, of, or a commodity index is an aggregation of all these individual markets. And all of those individual markets often may not be tied directly to an inflation story that's associated with the Fed or with uh, aggregate demand, it may be related to localized factors. And that means that they could be transitory and they could reverse if we have a different weather pattern. We could easily sort of see that, you know, especially for row crops, they usually, if you have a bad a bad season one year, not unless you have a you know, repeatable weather the next year, this is that excess uh, uh, in in shortage of supply in one year will be offset by greater planting in the following year, which will then cause a reversal in prices. So it's not as if you're uh, as though that you should hold commodities mar- markets now because higher inflation when a lot of the drivers of commodity markets could be very localized or very specific. No, absolutely. And it's been interesting to follow the, the whole debate you uh, see and, um, 
on 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 various medias and social uh, media as well, uh, and in the press and all of that. For example, and again, I'm not picking on anyone particular here, but I certainly feel that part of the uh, argument from the Bitcoin crowd, for example, has been, oh, but Bitcoin is a great hedge for inflation. Well, as soon as inflation actually starts to turn up, which it has done in the last six, eight months, Bitcoin is down 50% from its high, right? That you know, doesn't seem strike me as a very strong correlation between inflation and, and, and Bitcoin because, as you say, there are probably other factors playing in. The same could be said about gold. Everybody's been talking about, oh yeah, but gold will start to move higher when inflation turns, you know, comes back. Well, inflation is here, and gold is not moving higher for the moment. And so this is very, very interesting um, because some people truly believe in these kind of uh, statements. And and this is the hard part about. Uh, uh, we go back to Milton Friedman. He always said inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomena. Unfortunately, we found out in the post great financial crisis period that it doesn't seem to be the case. And I think that all of the transitory inflation arguments that uh, were brought up by Powell last year was like, well, it's just a supply congestion. Once the supply congestion is done, we'll get through this, prices will come back down. Or, you know, there's other localized issues, it'll come back down. And so, so the idea of even the concept of what is inflation or how do we measure it or when we use that term, it's more complex than what we give it credit for or, for certainly what you learned in your intro macro courses. Now, in commodities, there are a couple themes that are are, are really picking up that would suggest that prices could go higher again for uh, for uh, this next year. And one of the major themes that I've been talking about, and we see this in all the backwardation in futures markets these days, is that we're really moving from a just-in-time inventory management to a just-in-case inventory management. So, so the big developments in manufacturing and across the the world with it with low transportation costs and good logistics is that we could be able to get any part we need very quickly we could be able to turn it on and turn it off in terms of our supply chains at a moment's notice we could put things on a plane put them in a container get them across the world and so therefore we don't need to hold inventory and most of the business cycles we'll say pre 1995, pre 2000, you would sort of say that the the business cycle was driven by uh, mistakes in inventory management. This is, is it. So so you get aggregate demand wrong, inventories grow, production has to cut back so that inventories have to then be whittled down, and then we sort of come out of the recession. So so we moved to just in time. No one held inventories, so therefore you don't have to worry about you know inventory management of being able to sell off something, and so we could reduce fluctuations in the business cycle. Now we're switching to, well, I got to hold inventory because I don't know whether those containers are ever going to come. <laughs> I got to hold more inventory of oil because I don't know there whether there could be a disruption. I have to hold more inventory of grains or coffee because I don't know whether I'm going to be able to get it in time for my manufacturing process, or even if I'm Starbucks, can I get the coffee in, in, in my warehouses? So i am got to move to just-in-case. If you have a just-in-case world, you have more convenience yield. If there's more convenience yield in just-in-case world, you see more. You should see more backwardation in commodities. And we see that... Uh, for example, in the oil market, natural gas market, we see it in uh, the wheat market, you see it in the corn market, soybean markets. They're all to different degrees, but a lot of the markets are usually sh are showing in backwardation. And I think a lot of that has to do with it because people are holding more inventory than before. So I think that that's a major theme in commodity markets. The other themes is, is that uh, is capital expenditure. This is that... Mm -hmm. Because we're moving more to a green world, okay, there's been less capital expenditure into oil market and infrastructure. This is that oh, yeah. uh, even the boards of major oil companies are starting to become more green. So they're changing their focus. By changing their focus, 
we're going to sort of say there's going to be less money put to the exploration for different extraction metals, extraction commodities like oil. And if that's the case, is this is that there's more likelihood that we're going to have dis- supply disruptions. And I think that even when you think about uh, in the in the k- traditional grain markets, this is that natural gas prices go up, fertilizer costs go up for nitrogen. It's going to come uh, come back, and it's going to affect uh, 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 affect you know the farmer who's you know, planting row crops. And I think the green revolution affects the cost of, of of actually planting crops. And so I think that this is actually going to have an impact on commodities markets. And that's sort of the, it's not an inflation story, but it is a switch in demand and supply story that could play out for years. Yeah, no, I completely agree with uh, with what you've said. Now, we, we came from a point of challenges with forecasting and and so on and so forth. And I guess uh, one institution that tries to make forecasts um, and uh, does it in a very public way, not always getting it right, uh, like lately, uh, or maybe ever, some people might say, is the Fed. And you brought up a point where you talked about Fed policy and trend following. Tell us more. Well, the one thing I sort of say that everyone says is like, well, the Fed is going to start raising... uh, Rates and so therefore that should be a good trend environment. And I sort of say, unfortunately, is is I have to be, uh, I have to say, well, yeah, let's just wait a minute. This is is that they're expected to have, uh, you know, three to maybe four hikes this year. Well, the two year has already moved from about fourteen basis to one hundred seventeen. So in a two year basis, we've already sort of in, increased a hundred basis points in two year rates. So, so some of the uh, Fed hikes have already been baked in. So, so uh, it will sort of say that from the lows for the ten year, we're probably up around fifty five plus basis points. So, so we baked in at least two. So, so we'll, we'll sort of say that our markets are always forward looking. So, therefore, is this is that some of the expectations for what the Fed might do has already been embedded in price. So as a trend follower, that money has already been made or should have been made. Now we can only make money if there's going to be a change in expectations. And so uh, in some sense, this is that uh, it's hard for as a trend follower to say, okay, I should make more money because the Fed is going to do X going forward because some of that has already been discounted in in the in the market, and that's an, an important to realize when you look at what is the potential for trend following. You have to say what is the potential for trends going forward, not what's already been discounted. Yeah, I think where Fed policy and central bank policy in general, I think, plays a role in trend following is also how successful they are, generally speaking, in achieving their goals. And I think uh, part of the, I mean, it's interesting because the narrative that we've heard so long, and certainly I've been uh, part of that narrative to to say, oh yeah, but trend following has had a rough time the last few years. Well, I mean, we've just had three or four uh, at least three uh, really good years for trend following as an index. I know there are obviously differences in terms of manager by manager, but but the indices of trend following has actually done really well uh, in the last few years. So, you know, I think we need to retire that that narrative. But the reason why potentially the teens were challenging was the fact that central banks were probably quite successful in achieving this stability. So I think where 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 I see kind of a, a link is 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 central banks either if they get it really wrong and they're you know uh, hopelessly um, behind the curve in in what they need to be doing and or should have done already uh, and so on and so forth i think that that can create some um, interesting opportunities for for trend followers if i think back from when i started my career in the 80s um, back then and and people may have forgotten this, but back then the major economies in the world were not synchronized. So if Japan was doing well, other parts of the world were not doing so well economically and so on and so forth. But very slowly, these curves, these cycles got synchronized and the whole world got started to move in sync. And then what happened 
was the central banks um, managed to keep GDP growth, um, you know, uh, pretty stable, let's put it that, compared to history. And I think if 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 we get to a, a new sort of future where um, some of that synchronization gets out of whack, I actually think that the moves or the changes in GDP, and maybe COVID was the trigger, who knows? Because clearly we've seen some big moves in GDP, uh, both to the downside initially and then to the upside and, and, and all of that stuff. So if some of those things come back and we start seeing the whole world moving in the same direction and not being stable, like everything, you could actually expect maybe some big moves. And one of the things I've noticed, because I think it's on your list as well of points, is just to start to see what happened this month in some of the currencies. I mean, New Zealand dollar down all 4.5%. Australian dollar down 4% uh, towards the dollar in a month. I mean, it's been a while since we've seen moves in currencies. And in fact, if I look at, and I know this for a fact also from some of the peers that I follow, currencies has been the worst sector for us for a long time. I would say 10, 15 years at least, where there's been no opportunities really in the classical G7 currencies uh, from a trend following perspective. That might be changing. Right. And if that is changing... That's good news because it's a relatively big risk allocation because it's such a liquid market. Um, anyways, just oh, trying to make some of your points. The, the, with, with the that, currency yeah. markets are really important because a currency is, is, is just a relative value trade. It's the relative yeah. value trade of, of one economy versus, versus, uh, versus another. If all of the monetary policy and fiscal policy is, is, uh, is synchronous, you're not going to have any moves in currencies, and it's always going to be noise. And so we talked earlier about Daniel Kahneman and his book on noise. And so he said that systematic trading can reduce noise. Uh, but at the same time, is, is that if there is only noise in markets because the underlying fundamentals are stable, then there's no way that you can exploit that as trend following because ultimately trend following, as we always say, it's price-based. But it's it's also related to the long term fundamental changes in uh, in the drivers of that market. So uh, if we see that there is a long term differential or spread between interest rates in the U.S. versus Europe, is that that's going to be reflected in currency markets? That's going to be reflected in price trends. So if there's a long term differential. And a uh, in inflation between one country and another, that will be expressed in currency markets if there is a long term difference in growth. And what we'll sort of say that there have been sort of um, so, so we'll sort of, so I, I hate to make big generalizations, but we'll say the '90s and the early 2000s so, so were, were the period of what uh, Ben Bernanke called the Great Moderation. And he said some of it was about half of it was luck. And half of it was, you know, good monetary policy of inflation uh, targeting. Inflation targeting was used across the world by all central banks. They all got on the inflation targeting bandwagon. So everybody was following the same mantra, you know, 2% inflation. And so if you get there, there you're going to have very little variation in currencies. Then we had the great financial crisis, and then everyone got in the mantra that we got to do quantitative easing. So everybody was doing it. And so everybody was following the same things. Everybody drove their rates down to zero. And, you know, there's no currency trading for the simple reason is, is that, or limited trading because everybody had rates of zero. Now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't dislocations that you could exploit, but you didn't get the same level of exploitation uh, that was available. And so now what we're going to a period is, is that central banks are saying, I'm going to have a different view than the Fed. The Fed is sort of saying, I'm in some sense, you could sort of say it's getting more aggressive now. It's turned very hawkish. We don't know what the ECB is going to do. And so, so they're in a very different situation. Now, interesting, we saw the 10-year boond uh, actually get close to close to zero <laughs> like Hooray, we're back oh to my, zero. holy smoke it hit zero and then it, they came back off and then you sort of say that has nothing to do with uh, other than the fact is at some point they said like okay the inflation is just so out of control that i've got to be selling off some of this stuff and so the the clearing price got close to zero <laughs> so, so uh 
so so but we haven't seen a change in ECB policy yet. So so what so we're seeing divergence in central bank thinking, action, and divergence in what we'll sort of say that trend following and price based systems do well when there's higher dispersion in uh, across economies, across markets. And across behavior, uh, behavior, and we're seeing higher dispersion in stock prices, and so I think that active stock pickers are going to do better in that environment. But you see higher dispersion across all markets, and we're going to have a chance to to be able to do better across markets. It's not the same as a quote unquote an outlier story, uh, which we've talked about, but. It's just the idea that there's if there's more dispersion or more weight uh, uh, being pl- uh, or uh, across price movements, then there's an opportunity for trends. And I was doing some work on distribution, and it was unrelated to this outlier issue. But I think uh, we often talk about uh, you know distributions having fat tails. And so we, so mm-hmm. we, we talked about uh, leptokurtosis. So uh, or what the kurtosis is, is, is it? But if you look very closely, it, it's not fat tails in the sense is that all everything is greater dispersed. Uh, being leptokurtotic means is that you have more peakedness. So there's there's more likelihood that prices are going to be close to to zero if you have a zero one. But by given that, we also have like a little fatter tails. This is that there's True. there's another uh, type of distribution called uh uh kurtotic and that means it has uh flatter peaks in a flatter peak world what happens is that you could think about a normal distribution take the center of it and squish it down move down yeah and then you squish it down you have more of the distribution not only in your tails but also in the mid range if that happens that's very good for trend followers because it just says the probability that you're going to have a greater move is going to be much higher and this is what trend followers love to see, that uh, more dispersion in long-term volatility. Now, in reality, the, the difficult part of trading is, is that usually the transition to longer, long volatility is higher short volatility. And this gets back to our question earlier about exits. This is that if you have higher short volatility, then it's more likely you're going to get stopped out and you're going to sort of say, like, there could be, and this would be the question I've seen for decades now, is, is that I'll sort of say, okay, I've been trading the gold market, and someone will say, uh, well, we didn't really make much money in the gold market this this quarter. And they'll say, well, look, I just pulled up a chart. I'm looking at the price. The price is a lot higher today than it was three months ago. You must be a real idiot. Anybody could have made money trading trends in this. And I sort of said, like, well, no, because it's trend following with risk management, and I got stopped out in some of my trades along the way. So it's not as though I just look at what is the end price and the starting point, and I look at the that slope or the difference, and I said, that's whether I should have made money. It's a system actually sort of said that if there's higher short volatility, I could get stopped out of prices, and that could be what actually sort of drives my performance. So, so short, higher short volatility is the enemy of your classic trend follower. Longer long volatility is your friend. Yeah, and on top of that, just to go back and comment on your point about uh, this, and that is that we've kind of seen it a little bit this month, I think, um, and why trend followers, I think, are doing pretty well, is that we have lower correlation uh, between some of the markets than we have seen uh, recently. And and this is also why we argue this point about uh, why it's a good idea to add markets that, that have relatively low correlation to each other. Because if, if you do so, what you essentially do is you increase the number of independent bets in your portfolio. Right. And that's important. Uh, especially when you hunt for 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 these outliers, uh, so uh, so there are lots of benefits to that, uh, and I appreciate that. 
Now, Mark, in the interest of time, we still have a long uh, list of great topics. Um, so we may have to come back to them uh, next time you're on. But I was giving, I, was, I wanted to give you a chance to pick maybe one more that we want to just touch on today. Uh, there, you have something about trends following speed. You have more on crisis alpha. You have small and obscure markets. You have something about the narrative uh, of trend following. You have something about Chinese futures um, factors. <laughs> what do you want to? What do you want to finish off with today? Well, I, I think the main thing I, I, I like is is that looking at just the environment for January and what we have going okay. forward. And so the other topics okay. are all very interesting. And I guess you're going to have to have me come on again to talk about some of these. Oh, uh, we wouldn't want it any other way, Mark. But issue and and. Uh, when we talk about crisis alpha, when you look at different crises, some are very short-lived. Okay, so March mm-hmm. of 2020, uh, 20, you could sort of say it was less than a month. It was just you know there and sure. gone. And the ability of trend followers to exploit that was fairly wide across the, uh, the choice of trend followers. Some did well, some didn't. Okay, so yeah. uh, this January is not a crisis so when people talk about crisis alpha, I wouldn't sort of classify this. This is, as, sure. and this is when I initially talked about this return to normalcy, is that this is not something that uh, that is an overreaction. People are behaviorally, uh, you know, scared of something that they're exiting the markets uh, because of fear. Uh, what we're see- to seeing is, is that growth is lower. So that is trend is going down. We're seeing that Fed hikes are are in imminent, so that it means that interest rates are going up. We're seeing uncertainty. If you look at especially look at the University of Michigan survey, the survey levels are probably at they're they're lower than what they were in April of 2020, right after the pandemic. So so in, and that's taking into account the fact that the survey was done in March. It doesn't really count. So I'm looking one month out. This is that the, the numbers are, are are horrible, and you look at surveys. So, but these are all trends and fundamentals, and the trends and fundamentals means is that you're going to have trends in price. So, so this is not a crisis, but this return to normalcy is actually going to lead to longer term trends, which means is that holding a diversified portfolio of other assets that can go both long and short seems to have very uh, strong relevance. And I'll end up with the final uh, comment is, is that uh, there are some interesting research done by uh, Richard Enos. Uh, he's a pension consultant, one of the first quants in pensions. And he was looking at the endowment model. And he said, let's look at a lot of university endowments and then let's look at their their beta. If, if we, include, we include their private equity and their you know international and other stuff. You're saying that most of them right now is this is that they've all increased their equity exposure. Some are close to 90 plus percent equity if you look at what their beta exposure is. So oh, so oh. so there is no diversification in the endowments that they may have had diversification 10 years ago, but they've all got out of the equity bandwagon. So they have this huge allocation and huge beta exposure to equities. And what happens if, let's say, we return to normalcy? What they really need is some other asset styles that are going to be able to adjust quickly to a change in the normalcy of the market or this return to normalcy. So, And they're not going to get it from fixed income because the fixed income has actually been positively correlated this month. And this, this is that our traditional hedge for the last 30 years is not working. So that would argue is, is that you'd want to have something that could be able to be more di- diverse and be able to go long and short. And if you find out that your fixed income isn't working, then the one thing you want to have is a, is a strategy that might actually be able to go short bonds so that they could be able to take advantage of those trends if they materialize in the fixed income world. And so I think that if... Uh, if we look at the first quarter, this is that trend following looks like it has a more value 
to investors. And we've been doing some work for a client on what is called completion theory. And completion theory is say, like, let's look at the risks in the portfolio and see what you can do to plug in strategies that would sort of complete the portfolio or eliminate certain risks. And trend following is a great asset for portfolio completion in terms of being able to change the mix of your risk exposures quickly and dynamically in a way that you couldn't do if you had to wait for the investment committee to do that change themselves and they only meet quarterly. So you can be able to get changes in exposure more quickly with trend following than you could by waiting to see that the asset allocation change is done by a committee in their quarterly meetings. So what you say, if I hear you right, is you say trend following completes a portfolio. Yes, yes. And uh, it reminds me of that, isn't, wasn't it in Jerry Maguire or something yeah. like that, where he says so, or she says to him, you complete yeah. me. And uh, that must be the most romantic thing for we've heard about trend following, that trend following yeah. completes your yes, portfolio. I mean, trend following romantic. <laughs> I better we better stop there. <laughs> well, I think that's probably the high point we could uh, think about. Uh, but I do think it's an important question. I hope Alan is uh, is listening because he's coming up with some uh, our new allocator series. And actually, I would love for him to discuss. I know we've already recorded a couple of the episodes, so he won't be able to do that. But this whole point about concentration risk, I think, is a major issue. And if I think about the broader concentration in in markets, I think you can go even further. You can say on one hand, oh, but investors are now more concentrated in equities than they've ever been. That's a danger. Um, They can't offset it necessarily with fixed income. That's a danger. But on top of that, equity indices are more concentrated than they've ever been because they're driven by FANG stocks, right? Um, So there's a huge issue. There's a huge hidden risk I think, in the financial markets that we have not seen before. On top of that, you can add passive investments driven by flows. I mean, just look at the, again, I don't want to, I'm not trying to pick on anyone, but just look at what's happened in the ARC funds in the last six months where they've halved in value, not because the NASDAQ has gone down, right? I mean, so by 50%, it clearly hasn't gone down by 50%, right? But once these things start to flow and people start putting a redemption in rather than a subscription in some of these passive funds, uh, and I'm not saying they're doing that broadly speaking yet, but they could. And that's another kind of quote-unquote hidden risk that markets um, have not seen. Yeah, no no one has made money uh, when you look at a, a weighted average of when the money entered the ARC fund. Basically, they've made no money for investors because all the uh, the growth in the fund and all of the money came in at higher yeah. prices, they're all underwater. And this gets down to the whole issue of when we talked about the difference between a trend chaser and a trend follower. A trend chaser just sort of said like, oh, I see something moving higher, so therefore I should get in. And there's not a model. It's is it's, it's that there's an emotion. Well, the trend follower would say, uh, at some level, you could sort of say that they would sort of say, well, I may have missed the entry point on ARC on the long side. I would, And if I did get in at a better entry point, I probably would have said it reversed. I gave back some of my profits, but I probably exited. Now, if anything, is is going in the opposite uh, direction. So I would I would have a discipline to do something different. Yeah, and maybe there is data out there, but I think I seem to have seen a chart that suggests that some of this could easily be said about crypto as well. That most of the investors now at these levels are underwater in in crypto. Um, so, it, it, anyways, it, this is not a discussion about that, but it is interesting. It's worth uh, keeping an eye on, um, and I'm sure it's something we're going to be uh, talking uh, more about in in the future. I think with that, I think we're going to leave it for now. We have got some more topics, um, and there will be new ones, I'm sure, before we speak uh, next in a few weeks. Um, so, uh, so I appreciate that, Mark, for, for all of that. Let me just, and I know it's a little bit early for month end, because these numbers are as of Thursday without the last two trading days in the month. But still, I think Friday was probably a slightly positive day for 
CTA. So maybe certainly directionally, but maybe the levels will change a little bit. But in any way, it looks like a good start for the CTA industry as a whole for 2022. We have the BTOP50 index up almost 1.5%. Uh, we have the SOCGEN CTA index up 1.6% for the year and for the month. We have the SOCGEN trend index up a nice 3% uh, following the 9% growth in uh, 2021. The short-term traders index has come back strong up 1.76% so far this month. As I mentioned, my trend barometer is uh, recording a 66 number, which is a strong environment for trend following. We have the MSCI index down 7% so far as of Friday night. Um, not a great start to that year. And as we've talked about today, positive correlation, meaning that the world government bond index is also suffering in January so far down 1.3% as of Friday night. Next week, um, I am joined by the one and only Jerry Parker. So that's going to be a super fun and educational conversation so do make sure that uh, you send all of your questions uh, to us so that we can dig in. You can email them as usual to email, uh, sorry, to info at toptradersonblock.com and we'll do our best to bring them on the show. And um, of course, you're always able to follow all of us uh, on Twitter where from time to time we do manage to share some, uh, some good solid information. And of course, um, make sure you come back to the Top Traders Unplugged uh, website, the new website. Uh, on a regular basis as we are starting to post more content uh, every week and also the daily um, trend barometer and the daily score resources are now back in full operation. Uh, it's taken a while to get the last uh, data up and running and I have a feeling we're going to be doing more uh, interesting stuff in the future as well. From Mark and me, thanks ever so much for uh, listening. We look forward to being back with you next week. Until next time, Take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.